there's no God. There's no God. There is none like you. Hey God, there is none like you. In my weakest hour, there's none like you. Hallelujah. I'm so glad he picked me up. Somebody say, and he turned me around. Hey, he placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah. Pastor Riddick said he's turning it around. He said he's turning it around. Anybody believe he's turning around? There's no God. There's no God. So behold, he comes yeah. riding on a cloud, shining like the sun at the trumpet's call. So lift your voice. Now, it's the year to believe. God praise right where you are. If you serve a mighty God, give him praise as we transition in this service. Hallelujah. Would you put those hands together one more time? Let's give God praise all over this place. Come on, let's really exalt him tonight. Come on. Let's really extol his name tonight. We've come to worship. We've come to honor him tonight. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, all that is within me, oh, bless his holy name. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all of the earth. Sing unto the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. What a joy and privilege it is to be in the presence of the Lord. Will you share with us in our opening hymn? Located in the back of your booklets, hymn number five, we are marching to Zion.
Our evening prayer is going to be read by the Reverend Alvin Armstead, pastor of the First Union Baptist Church in Richmond, Virginia, followed by the reading of God's Word, the Reverend Tyrell Brown of the Morning Star Baptist Church, Richmond, Virginia. I will bow our heads at this time for a word of prayer. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. God, we've come tonight thanking you for how you have met us once again at our home by the sea. We've come this week from our respective places to be revived and renewed. This week, God, some of us came walking. Some of us came limping. Some of us came crawling. But we're here, oh God. And as you've met us in time past, you've already met us this week in a powerful and unusual way. And so, Lord, tonight, we've come for a word from you, a word of hope a word of power, a word of confidence, a word of strength, a word of renewal. And God, if there's one thing we know and we've been reminded of thus far is that the word still works. The word works, God, in our homes. It works in our churches. It works in our communities. And even in this world, the word still works. So tonight, Lord, bless us as your leaders and laity, as your preachers and pastors. Bless us as your musicians and psalmists. Bless us through your word tonight. Use tonight our conference preacher in an unusual way. God, we pray that you would anoint him afresh tonight. Allow him to speak your word with power with clarity, with unction, and with authority. So that when we've gone down from this place, we might know that we've been in the presence of our God. Have your way tonight, God. We stand as empty vessels, saying, fill us up till we want no more. Fill us till we're overflowing. Fill us till we're running out of the convocation on our way back to our cities saying God is still able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine. We know you can do it, God. Lord, we're just waiting on you. Move by your power tonight. Pour out your spirit. And we'll be careful, Lord, to give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. This is our prayer tonight. In the strong, mighty, and matchless name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, we pray. And the people who love God, shout amen. Amen, amen and amen.
Let the church say amen. Our scripture reading tonight is found in the ninth book of the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Here is the reading of the word. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king amongst his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical structure because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse called Abinadab, and he made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there remains yet the youngest. And there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, sin and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he went and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, doing, and hearing of his word. Good evening, Hampton. I am James, better Jimmy Abington, former director of, co-director of music here at the Hampton Conference. Thank you. I bring you glad greetings from my church, the Friendship Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, as we celebrate our 155th anniversary and move into our new sanctuary July the 30th and my pastor and his wife Dr. and Mrs. Richard Will Sr. are here and I want you to know who my pastor is. Yeah, I go to church, just not to college. I have been asked to introduce someone that is no stranger but it has been seven years since he was able to be with us. This person when asked, what would you like for me to say, the only thing he could come up with, tell him that I am the son of a Baptist minister. 
And it is ironic that my pastor, Reverend Richard Wills, was baptized by his father, and he says that Joseph was his first music director. So there's a unique connection. While Joe has distinguished himself all over the world as a concert pianist, certainly most recently the Broadway music director of Motown and the orchestrator of The Color Purple, which got a Grammy for the best cast recording, Joseph is a church musician. Dr. Rudy Sr. and Jr., you will remember because he dedicated the Steinway Grand Piano at the Bethel Church. A few years ago, actually it was in 2009, Joseph released his CD here, Total Praise, and some of you would have been here to remember that. Tonight, he will be playing for us in the slot of the anthem from his new CD, which is entitled, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, a selection called All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name and Holy, Holy, Holy. Joseph will be available. To, obviously, we've come to worship tonight, but tomorrow between 11 and 5 o'clock, Joseph will be available with his new CD in Clark Hall, which is across campus, so that you can meet, hear him, purchase his CD, take him home with you and have him sign it. But Hampton, please welcome back to the Keys Joseph Joubert.
one of the hallmarks of Hampton is that we are always exposed to God's very best. Will you put your hands together one more time? Let's appreciate the wonderful gift. The Lord's blessed us all day long. What a wonderful experience we've had. One of the things that we're very intentional about as we go throughout this week is to make sure that we are able to minister to both head and heart. Toward that end, on this coming Thursday, we will share together in a forum with all of our presenters. Also, I'd like to encourage the attendees to engage in that forum by providing an opportunity to ask questions. Of course, it would be helpful if we have questions in advance as you hear the various presenters each day and evenings. So you will find on the screens periodically a, uh, a site, a website where you can submit your questions and also you can download the Hampton University Ministers app on your phones. On that app, you will be able to uh, submit your questions as well. The president of this university, Dr. William Harvey, has just published his new book, Principles of Leadership, the Harvey Leadership Model. Dr. Harvey is in the convention center lobby this evening signing his new book and certainly would encourage each of you to go by and pick up a copy and not only pick up the copy but read it and be able to use many of the principles that Dr. Harvey shares. Well, it's preaching time. We've come this evening with one question on our mind. Is there a word from the Lord. Who better to introduce our preacher of the evening than his father? It's my happy privilege to present to you Bishop Rudolph McKissick Sr., who will come at this time to present his son. Thank you, Dr. Dwight Reddick Sr., who is the Hampton University Ministers Conference President, and certainly to Dr. William R. Harvey of Hampton University, who is the President, Dr. Deborah Hagens, chaplain of the university and executive director of our conference and to all of the brothers and sisters in the Lord, especially uh, to the preaching rank, and to all of our, you. 365 days ago, I presented the same preacher before the conference. And I sat there thinking that you uh, really don't want to hear me. But I had to just reflect how God moves in mysterious ways with his wonders to perform. And that in 1983, his heart's desire was to be a, an opera singer in 1983. He wanted to be an opera singer, and he would say, all the way to the Metropolitan Opera House, all the way to the Metropolitan Opera House in 1983. He entered Florida State University. He wanted to go <laughs> to Metropolitan Opera House. I'm thanking God that he didn't go because in 2017 I would not be standing here presenting him as the preacher. And so since 
all of his accomplishments are in this wonderful souvenir. If you haven't read it, you will read it. What I can say, God moves in mysterious ways. Instead of him being in the Metropolitan Opera House singing, he's in on the campus of Hampton University preaching the gospel. And after all of these years, many have presented their sons. But thank God, I'm standing in my 89th year, going on 90. And all I can say, I know that after all he's been through, that the Lord has called him to preach the gospel. And my prayer, and I know your prayer will be that the Lord will use him so in this place there'll be some deliverance. In this place there'll be some healing. In this place there'll be some restoration. In this place there'll be some praising. And then in this place, we're going to hear the word of God so we can leave this place and live what we have learned. I wish I had a great amen. Let me present to you after the choir, one of the preaching preachers in this world, in that of Rudolph Waldo McKissick, Jr. Hear ye him.
if you would be so kind as to stand on your feet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we thank you tonight. For the total sufficiency of your son and our savior. For the privilege of being in this place that we have turned into sacred space. We give you the praise. For the privilege of preaching your word. I am humbled. Stand up now in your servant. Grant unto me preaching power. God, I don't stand to entertain or to impress, but only that you be glorified. So speak, Lord. We want to hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou dost do. In the matchless, marvelous, majestic name of the Master, we pray. Amen. Can you just give God a praise even before you go to your seats? Just to thank him for who he is. Hallelujah. You may take your seats. In the very presence of our God, we give all honor tonight to the Spirit of Christ. To the wonderful president of this university, Dr. William Harvey to the president of this wonderful Hampton Ministers and Musicians Conference, my friend and my brother who preached a fit on us last night, Dr. Dwight Riddick, to Dr. Deborah Hagens, who is the executive minister, to all of the officers, to all of the past presidents, to my hero and my bishop, my father, thank God for him tonight to all of you pastors preachers musicians lay leaders my brothers and sisters in Christ and in creation the Lord our God is good and he is worthy to be praised I am humbled and honored to be back this year at the Hampton Ministers Conference this place has much meaning for me, my mother is a 1950 graduate of what was then known as the Hampton Institute. We have two children. My darling wife is here, my beautiful bride up there on the second row with my mother-in-law. She's preaching her first sermon in three weeks, starting Virginia Union in September. Y'all pray my strength in the Lord. Amen. We have two children who are students here at Hampton University. Yeah, they get all our money. And they are juniors and sophomores. And so to be here on the campus where my mother graduated and where my children are matriculating and where as a teenager I came to Ogden Hall with my father in all of that heat to hear the generals of the faith preach the gospel it is a signal honor to be here to share again and to all of those who are sharing on this week I thank God for all of you you've heard the reading of the word of the Lord in first Samuel chapter 16 I will not read all of that again but I want to read just a couple of verses to kind of center our focus in verse 10 it says, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, and there he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes. So he sent and brought him in, and he was ruddy and bright-eyed good-looking and the Lord said arise and anoint him for this is the one I want to preach tonight as the spirit shall guide with this thought 
in our minds the anointing of an afterthought the anointing of an afterthought without any doubt last November set us as a nation off on what has already been one of the more interesting periods in American history <laughs> No matter what side of the political spectrum you fall on, you would have to admit tonight that what we have witnessed thus far has made for great television. <laughs> you tune in almost every day to see what new tweet has sparked new discussion. Now to be very clear and to be very sure, I'm not here tonight to debate the policies of our new commander in chief. I'm not here tonight to even share my opinion about his ways or his tweets. But one of the things that has been interesting to observe, like it or not, is in him how a person who has no experience in the ring of politics can become the new leader. How somebody that is not prepared <laughs> can get the assignment. While I may have thoughts on the process and the philosophy of the process and how it played us to get played, the reality is this premise of someone who's not prepared getting the assignment is not something new. The truth of the matter is God seems to gravitate towards choosing per per persons who don't seem to fit the bill. This is one of the more familiar stories in all of the Bible, and I know I took a chance in this setting to preach such a familiar story, the anointing of the shepherd boy David as the new king of Israel after the rejection of Saul. God has told Samuel that it's time to stop his grieving over the rejection of Saul and get himself together for the next assignment. And he gives instructions to Samuel to fill his horn with oil because I've chosen a new king amongst the sons of Jesse. He gets to Jesse's house and tells them that he has come down there to consecrate and that there's somebody in the house that has a word over their life. And that when the horn of oil gets poured on their head, it will be the sign of the Lord that their destiny is to be the new king. What we learn in this text tonight is something about the selection process of God. Because we see in this text how the selection process is played out when one is chosen for an assignment. And what I learned was sometimes the person God has in mind is not the first thought, but the afterthought. You know the text, Eliab comes up first and Samuel gets to assuming that he's the one and the text says Samuel took one look at him and based upon his look he thought he had to be the one and Samuel may have been trying to, to find someone who looked like Saul he was stuck on an old thing trying to make a new thing look like an old thing and then the next son comes and the next son comes and on and on and on and seven sons pass before Samuel and not once is there an unction to pour the oil out and now that God has spoken to Samuel about how to choose and how not to choose his discernment kicks in and the Bible tells us that Jesse David's father did not even include David in the lineup of his sons and that Samuel says you've got to have somebody else and Jesse says to him I've got one more and there he is out there keeping the sheep and when Samuel and Jesse were looking at Eliab and the other sons, God was looking at David. That in reality, David was just an afterthought to Jesse. As a matter of fact, God says to Samuel before he gets there, I've already chosen someone, which means Samuel didn't go down there to do a process of elimination or to interview somebody for qualifications. What was an afterthought to Jesse was the first thought of God. And let's just be honest and put it on the table tonight. A whole lot of us in here 
are anointed afterthoughts we weren't the first choice of some people we didn't seem to fit what others thought was needed we didn't seem to have what it would take to fit the bill people overlooked us and defined us and confined us and i know you're dressed up tonight you got all your new suits and dresses for hampton but if you are honest tonight there are many of us in here who can testify i'm just an anointed afterthought nobody thought I would make it nobody thought I would be here nobody thought I would be able to do this well but you were the first thought of God when you were the afterthought of everybody else that's why you can't concern yourself with where people place you in their process of potential because when you are an afterthought to people God will have you as his first thought and I don't know why God does it I don't know why God chose me I'm just glad God chose to choose me I don't have the answers to why other folk overlook me but is there anybody tonight that can be glad that when other folk didn't have you on their mind God had you on his mind as the first thought of purpose and promise God specializes in anointing afterthoughts God specializes in selecting people who don't seem to have what it takes to fill the bill. There are several things this text teaches me. One of the things this text teaches me in the selection process of God, Bill, is you have to learn how to appreciate the no while you're waiting on the yes. Um, um, just as Samuel stands to anoint Eliab, the word of the Lord comes and said, that ain't the one. <laughs> then the next one comes, God said, that ain't the one. Then the next one comes, that ain't the one. Then each of the sons comes through and Samuel, now knowing that he's got to trust divine discernment, gives a no to each of the sons that comes back. And he never loses his cool. He never gets frustrated at what seems to be happening. He never gets frustrated at the fact that he was sent there to do something and he hadn't found what he was looking for. And then it hit me. It is just as much of a blessing to be able to know what it is not as it is to know what it is. It is just as much a blessing to be able to know what is not it, even while you wait for God to show you what is it that sometimes we can get so concerned about trying to figure out what it is and we get frustrated when we can't seem to find what God told us he had for us but I came to tell you tonight it is just as much of a good thing to be discerning enough to know when something is not what God has for you and we can get so caught up on searching for it that we fail to see the blessing in being able to know what it is not. You, you got to be able to walk into a place or into a job or into a ministry and say, I don't know yet what God has for me, but I know this ain't it. And, and that's important. That's important because Bishop Alexander, if you waste your oil, trying to anoint all the stuff that ain't it by the time the thing that is it shows up you have nothing left for where your oil was intended to be poured out God help me. You, 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 you don't have to walk through the first door that opens you don't have to take the first church that asks for your resume. You don't have to take the first staff position offered to you because the word over your life and the anointing on you is too valuable to get mixed up with anything that ain't the right thing. And tonight, even if you still searching for it, you ought to celebrate that you knew how to say no when that wasn't the right thing. You, you have to know how to hold on to the oil and not waste it on the wrong thing. 
It may look like the right thing. It may feel like the right thing. Everything might seem to be in order, but if you don't hear God, walk away and thank God you had enough maturity to know that's not where your oil belongs. Too many preachers have lost their oil because they wasted it losing patience with the timing of God and when the right assignment showed up you had no oil left because you wasted it trying everything that came your way how many spiritual fathers and mothers have become frustrated wasting their oil on sons and daughters that weren't qualified. Trying to make it fit instead of waiting on God. I'm trying to tell you it's a good thing to be able to walk into a place and know that is not it. Because if you don't know what isn't it, you'll fool around and end up doing the right thing in the wrong place. And ain't nothing more frustrating than being in the wrong place trying to do. Is there anybody tonight that can look back over your life at some of the things you walked away from and you can say, God, I thank you that I had enough sense to know that wasn't the church, that wasn't the staff, that wasn't the friendship, that wasn't the connection, that wasn't the ministry, that wasn't the job. Thank you that I know when it ain't it. Don't end up spending your years wasting your anointing in a place God ain't called you to be. Samuel says, I don't see anymore. And God told me that the one I'm to anoint would be one of yours. And while I ain't sure who it is, I know the ones I'm looking at ain't it. So there's got to be another boy somewhere because I know what God told me and I know this is where God told me to be and I know this is what God told me to do so until I see it and until I do it I'm going to stay right here because this is where he wants me to do see here's where we get messed up we leave places too quickly when we get frustrated by what seems to be futility. Whatever you do, don't leave the assignment until it's complete. And frustration is not always the evidence of completion. We mismanage the process because our frustration begins to dictate our decision. In your selection process, know what ain't it and shout over that just as much as you do when you find what is it. But then there's something else. You've got to understand the difference in preparation and qualification. Okay, watch this. Jesse said, there's another boy, but he's just out there watching the sheep. Don't miss this. Because if you look back, particularly at verses 12 and 13, get the inference in the action. Everyone else got a heads up and was able to wash up, clean up, get decent, and get anointed. God, I feel it. Everybody else gets to go through the purification rite and get ritually cleaned up for the consecration selection. That's preparation. But when David comes in the room, right off the sheep pasture God says get up and anoint him which means David gets no heads up he has been sitting all night in the pasture with the sheep he doesn't get to shave he doesn't get to shower he doesn't get to change his clothes God help me in here today he comes in with the smell on him from where he's been and God says that's the one I want now, 
Now, Bill, what messed me up was when I read the text again, something I'd never seen, preachers. Read what happens when he comes in the room. It says, Jesse said, I've got one more, but he is keeping the sheep. Samuel said, sin bring him, but we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now, he was ruddy with bright eyes, good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for he is the one. Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. We aren't told his name until we see his anointing. See, too many of us want a name, but ain't looking for an anointing. But somebody that wants to serve can't be interested in making your name known. You got to be interested in the anointing of the Lord. I'm talking to somebody in here. You ain't getting called on stages. You ain't getting invitations all over the world. But you ought to rejoice tonight. Because if don't nobody know your name, let them see your anointing. I wish I had somebody in here. Don't you run trying to chase names. and Don't you run trying to be a bishop. Don't you run trying to be somebody. You just let God anoint you and he will make your name great. Too many folk are chasing name instead of chasing anointing. We aren't told his name until the oil is poured on him. Stop being mad at who don't know you. Jesus. Stop running trying to be a bishop with ain't nothing, with ain't nothing but a man given title. I'm in trouble now for real. Make sure you run after the anointing. Now watch, watch, sit down, watch. Watch what happens. Um, David didn't get cleaned up. He didn't get washed up. He didn't get consecrated. He didn't get purified. He smells like sheep. But he got the assignment. This is the season where God is going to choose some who may not be prepared, but they might be qualified. I'm going to get in trouble tonight. On this day, the word was over the life of somebody who didn't get sanctified and purified and consecrated and they stink. but they qualify. I'm trying to find my help in here tonight. I'm looking for somebody who can say, I might not be prepared, but I am qualified. I, I might not have all that other stuff everybody else has, but I am qualified. Can I tell you why some people don't like you? Because they got consecrated. You didn't, but you got the elevation. There's some folk don't like you because they got the degree, but you got the church. Everybody knows their name, but everybody sees your humility. Now, let me, let me balance this. Please don't get me wrong. I am not suggesting that you don't need preparation. Let me balance it. I, I believe in academic and theological preparation. It gives you the tools you can't get anywhere else. It'll give you what YouTube won't give you. It'll teach you how to have a stream of consciousness for yourself and not just regurgitate secondhand revelation from a book. You, you need academics and theological preparation, but, but don't get so caught up on the academy that you miss out on the anointing. I knew I was going to get in trouble saying that at Hampton. Don't 
get so driven to be smart that you lose sight that you need to have power. God help me in here tonight. Because the academy will give you tools, but the anointing will give you power. Go learn everything about Tillich and Cone and Booba and Brueggemann and Sweet and everybody else. But at the end of the day, if you want power when you preach and power when you lay hands and power when you counsel, you got to have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I know we don't talk about that much in this setting, but I believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. It'll give you what you don't have. It'll make up the shortage where you come. I'm sure you've got to have academy and anointing. Let me, let me tell you one more thing. I'll see you tomorrow night. Understand in the selection process, what you call disappointment, God calls preparation. Sometimes the preparation is in the process. That's, 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 a, that's a cuss word to these young preachers. They, they don't want process. They want it all right now. They want everything quicker than not yet and sooner. They, they want it all. But there's a process that must be trusted and respected. Um, Marvin, it's hard to handle when your assignment and your gifting seem to be in two different places. And the struggle becomes, you don't get to pick your timing for your assignment. God help me right through here. You don't pick it, you submit to it. You, you got a choice, you got a choice. Either embrace where God has you or spend your time frustrated because you feel entitled to where God hadn't put you yet. And you will never be a good steward and operate in excellence over where you are, spending your time frustrated over where you think you belong. David gets anointed and is sent right back to the sheep. <laughs> With the anointing of kingship on him. God help me in here tonight. Um, this is a tough place to be, Dr. Gina Stewart. He, he is anointed to be the king, but is assigned to go watch sheep. And it's frustrating to know that you have an anointing to do something, but the assignment you are in right now looks nothing like the anointing that's on your life. You don't know how to operate in excellence in the second position. So you get mad and go start a church because you don't know how to manage excellence where you are. David gets the anointing, but not the job. And he has to serve Jesus without saying what's in his future. He just has to be patient and wait on the time. Here it is. Can you be faithful and believe that God is in control and not want it so bad that you jump the gun? Can I tell you? Two of the most glorious words to the believer in faith are not yet. <laughs> Y'all didn't get it. Some of the best words you got in your faith arsenal are not yet. It, I, I don't have it, just not yet. I haven't walked into it, just not yet. See, sometimes I ain't waiting on my change to come. I'm just waiting on my turn to come. And can you be faithful when you've got to serve with excellence in a position beneath your potential? 
It looks like disappointment. Jesus. But it's really preparation. Because only folk that can tend the sheep know how to tend the people. God help me in here tonight. Only folk that's got a little stink on them know how to relate to the people. Folk who ain't got no stink on them and who are always clean and pristine and got 50 members and 30 armor bearers. That ain't the one God's looking for. God's looking for somebody that's got some stink on them to remember where God brought them from so you don't get too high on yourself and you'll always know if it had not been. Do I have any stink folk in here? I know you got your cologne on and I know you got your bonded number nine on, but how many of y'all can say, I know where he brought me from. I know the pasture he delivered me out of and I keep my stink before me to remember where he brought me from. It's, it's preparation cause David don't know it, but everything he's, going through when he goes back is getting ready for him when he goes forward because when he gets to Saul <laughs> Saul said you can't fight this giant David said oh I've been prepared I fought a lion and I fought a bear and I didn't know then what I was fighting about. But now that I'm in this moment, I can look back on what I was fighting and see that God was just getting me ready. Now here comes the final shout. Bill, we never would have known David had fought lions and bears if Saul uh, had not questioned him. These are fights he's been through that don't nobody know about because it wasn't nobody but him and God in the middle of that fight. See, here's the truth tonight. You got some fights you've been in that your members don't know about, that your friendship circle don't know about, and every private fight you've been in has been getting you ready for your public assignment. Do I have any honest folk tonight who can say, I've had some private fights. I've had some private struggles. I cried Saturday night before I preached Sunday morning. I wrote the resignation letter a Saturday before I got to the pulpit Sunday morning I took my gun out and was ready to kill myself I ain't looking for all the bougie folk I'm looking for the honest folk tonight who can say tonight is the night where I'm gonna give God a public praise for every private battle I've been in the person sitting next to you don't even have a clue everything you fought the person sitting next to you don't know the nights you sleep the folks sitting next to you don't know the days you cried yourself to sleep take your neighbor by the hand and tell your neighbor neighbor you don't have a clue all the fights I've been in you don't have a clue all the struggles I've had I preach like I preach because of my private fights I shout like I shout because of my private fights I holler like a holler because of my private fights is there anybody in here who ain't ashamed tonight to give God the praise because if you had private fights that means you had private victories if you're in Hampton tonight it's because you had victory in areas nobody knows about good night Hampton may the Lord God bless you real good but is there anybody in here who can help me close this sermon stand on your feet and tell somebody I've been in some private fights don't nobody know what I fought don't nobody know what I've been through would you do me one last favor would you take your neighbor by the hand and tell your neighbor neighbor oh, 
neighbor you just don't know that was the wrong neighbor turn on the other side put your arms around somebody shake them and rock them rock them and shake them shake them and rock them and tell them neighbor neighbor I've been through some stuff that I ain't told nobody about. I've been through some pain that I didn't call my boys about. I've been through some tears that I didn't tell my wife about. But I'm so glad that I serve a God who brought me out. Would you do me one favor? Would you give God a public shout for all your private victories? Will you give God a public praise because he brought you out will you give God a public praise because he delivered you won't he do it won't he do it won't he do it won't he fight your battles won't he make your enemies your footstool won't he give you joy and sorrow won't he give you hope for tomorrow won't he dry your tears won't he won't he won't he won't he won't he won't he and because i know he's gonna give me victory because i know he's gonna bring me out i'm not gonna wait till the battle is over i'm shouting right now and is there anybody in this place tonight that ain't ashamed right now to thank god for your assignment because everything you went through got you ready for this every fight you went through got you ready for this every lion you fought got you ready for this and if you're still waiting stay right there because they that wait upon the lord renew their strength they'll mount up on wings like an eagle they will run and not get weary and take your neighbor by the hand and tell them neighbor you shout for my victory I'll shout for your victory you don't even know what it was it happened in private but just the fact that I'm here means God brought me out so shout for your neighbor cuz you came out scream for your neighbor cuz God brought him out jump for your neighbor cuz God brought them out yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, if you would stand still so that we can all leave together. Please don't walk. Let's not disrespect the moment. Please stand still. Somebody ought to come on and bless the wonderful name of the Lord in this place tonight. Thank God tonight for Bishop Rudolph McKissick, Jr.
want you to go tonight under the anointing of this powerful word. As you leave this place tonight, you ought to thank God for every public and private victory that he has given you. The Lord bless you tonight as the Spirit of the Lord rests upon you. You may be it.